The most common thing that my students have, which is lovely to be able to say, is that everyone is coming with a sincere intention to grow and to learn about themselves. Many people that I've worked with are more coming from the kind of introspective, reflective approach, more kind of looking inwards to learn, but often are looking also to branch out or understand there's more to psychedelics, you know? So maybe actually someone's been working in, in some method for a while and they think, I'd like to freshen up my practice. I think there's, there's more to this. There's, there's more that I can get out of working with psychedelics. If we think of working with psychedelics as kind of exploring, exploring the world of psychedelics and different ways of working with that. Okay, John, welcome to MindMeld. After a few false starts here in so many different ways, uh, no one needs to know that though, but now they do. Now they're here in this conversation with us. Now they know that this is not the first time that we hit record today. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Uh, like you say, not the first time, but we didn't we didn't get too far in, so uh, I think we're good. And um, yeah, thanks for having me. Pleasure to sit down and have the chance to speak with you. Yeah, absolutely, man. And I think this is going to be one of my favorite podcasts to date. And I already know that because we've had a few conversations that have ignited me, and I'm really interested in exploring more about psychedelics and how they can be used as a tool for thought to enhance creativity to um, bear more fruits into the one's life, right? I feel like for me anyways, you haven't really truly lived and you haven't really fully lived until you've had at least uh, an experience. It's not to say that everyone needs to do it, but I think that it's a great tool for personal growth. And that's where I want to bring your expertise. You've been researching and having, a, I don't countless experiences of your own. And now you're bringing that to hopefully the masses. I'm hoping that more and more people will start to learn how to use this tool um, a little bit more responsibly. So where I really want to start actually with this conversation is sort of an overview of your course that you're teaching. Just very, um, you know, just high level what you're going to be teaching in your course on, on how to use psychedelics, because it will absolutely set the stage for everything else we're going to be talking about today uh, in our conversation. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, happy to. Um, so yeah, the course really is for psychedelic explorers. It's for people who are working with psychedelics and it's not limited really to any single specific purpose. There's there's lots of different ways of working with psychedelics. I like to think of myself as kind of method agnostic. You know, there's there's different ways, you know, there's the what's pretty common now, the headphones and eye mask kind of therapy style approach, directing your attention inwards. There's people using them for creativity. You know, there's been lots of great thinkers and musicians who have been working with psychedelics and using them in their processes, scientists too. Um, there's people working in groups, there's people going solo. There's all kinds of different ways of working with them and bearing fruit for, um, from these processes that arise. So really the course is for anyone who's really looking to work with psychedelics in a kind of more intentional way and to 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 make the most out of their, their psychedelic path. So Maybe just an easy way for me to kind of give an overview is to kind of just go over the, the four key modules of the course. And um, those are path preparation, session preparation, session integration, and path integration. So the first one, path preparation, this is basically preparing to walk the psychedelic path. So it's preparing to work with psychedelics. So this is kind of foundational stuff that I think whichever type of method or route or where you're going to be working with psychedelics, this is kind of applicable across the board. So this is the kind of things like intentions, looking at your relationship with psychedelics, like how, how do you relate to them? You know, how, how do they make you feel and uh, do you trust them? And these kind of things that I think is kind of important to look at that really before getting stuck in or very helpful at least anyway um and um and yeah and and things like support you know having a support network having people you know that you can turn to if things come up psychedelics can be can open big doors and 
sometimes that can be kind of destabilizing, you know, and so it's good to have in place a support network. So this kind of foundational stuff is kind of the first module and that's preparing basically to engage and work deeply with psychedelics. The second module is uh, session preparation. So this is where each explorer or student then starts preparing for a specific session. So then we're kind of honing in a little bit and thinking, okay, choosing kind of one intention or one method or mode of working with psychedelics. Mentioned a couple earlier, you know, creativity or healing or maybe outside in nature, you wanna connect more with the natural world. Whatever it is, it's choosing one of those. And then we go through a few lessons to prepare for that specific experience. So there's 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 a few different things there. There's thinking about who you're going to be tripping with, if you're going to be needing a sitter, where is it going to be, what's the logistics of that? You you need some certain supplies or equipment, you know, um, music, all, all these kinds of things. So it's kind of going through step by step and preparing for that specific session. Then each explorer will take that be be prepared sufficiently prepared they'll have that session and then we come into module three which is session integration and integration is pretty pretty big field now in the psychedelic space it's almost become becoming its own kind of field um so this is yeah integrating the experience and so that might be hopefully if there's been some benefits and positives that's going to be kind of incorporating those into our day-to-day life, how we bring them forward, how we bring them out into our day-to-day life, you know, integrating that experience and kind of maybe looking at key themes and uh, things that we actually need to do because, you know, sometimes you you need to take action. It's like maybe you have a big idea or something and, but there's, you know, the story doesn't end there. Life goes on and, you know, you're maybe going to need to do some work to integrate that. So, um, That's basically the third thing. And that's also includes kind of ways of processing the experience and reflecting on it. So there's different methods to explore there. And I should also say at this point, it's the kind of course is kind of an exploration as well. I'm a a great believer in people finding an approach which works for them and and recognizing that different things are gonna work for different people. So it's an opportunity for people to kind of create their own approach as it were in terms of preparation and integration and and maybe trying out a few different um, complementary modalities and and finding really and identifying okay this worked you know i'm going to carry that forward Um, i digress and then we go on to the fourth module uh, which is path integration and that is integrating as a person as a psychedelic person as a person who works with psychedelics over the long term, you know, not just a, not just a one-off kind of thing. Someone that's re-engaging with them, coming back for different lessons, and so in there, there's there's this that's kind of yeah, that's this is kind of cool. There's a few fun lessons in there, I think. Um, but maybe I'll get into that a bit later. But there's also some kind of uh, some kind of like it's it's kind of longer-term thinking. You know, there's some kind of basic lessons and fundamentals about yeah walking the path and going on that journey of growth so this is why i wanted to start with this because a it kind of gives an an overview of how you're teaching people to use these tools and these like substances more uh, effectively and more consciously right it's not just something that you do uh, for fun in the park with your friends one day which you probably could that can be part of a session But now you're kind of breaking it down to you have the path and you have your sessions. The path from what I'm gathering is sort of your overview, your the way that you relate to psychedelics is your relationship with it in your life and the path that you want to walk. And then the sessions are the individual sessions along that path. And those sessions can be different every time. So it's not just, oh, I do psychedelics because I want to be more creative. It's like, no, you can do it this one time uh, to uncover something about yourself um, for therapeutic reasons. Another time you can do it because you want to create a piece of art. Another time just to enjoy nature. So I guess where we can kind of go from this is sort of like, what are some of the paths that you see your students going on? And what are some of the paths that you kind of um, help people recognize? I guess the, the, the most common 
thing that my students have, which is lovely to be able to say, is that everyone is coming with a sincere intention to grow and to learn about themselves. Um, I would probably say, actually, a lot of people or many people that I've worked with are more coming from the kind of introspective, reflective uh, approach, more kind of looking inwards to learn, to begin, but often are looking also to branch out or understand or have glimpsed or, or, or for, for whatever reason, understand there's more to psychedelics, you know? So maybe actually someone's been working in, in some method for a while and they think, I'd like to freshen up my practice. I think there's, there's, more, to, there's more to this. There's, there's more that I can get out of working with psychedelics. And so th this, is, this is something I enjoy doing, working with people, you know? Like, it, 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 I mean, it's like, it, <laughs> if we think of working with psychedelics as kind of exploring, exploring within the exploration you know different there's exploring the world of psychedelics and different ways of working with them some people also maybe have glimpsed something and they, they're like there's something there but they want to go deeper you know I, I think i find myself in that category for sure i haven't i've been microdosing uh, psilocybin for quite a while in fact today is another day when i'm doing it. i feel like it's a great time to do that during a conversation like this um but having a macro dose having one of these intentional experiences is not something i've had for a little while and i kind of like feel it calling me is that something that people have said and, and it kind of seems like that's what you're kind of getting at like it almost calls you um i've had friends and relatives saying that a specific uh substance calls them like they, they really want to try ayahuasca they had like i don't want to try L lsd don't want to do MDMA. It's like specifically ayahuasca is calling me. It's like for me, I don't really have a specific substance, potentially LSD, because it's not something that I've experimented with before. But how do you know when it's sort of time and you're ready for this experience, especially for people who are like kind of maybe scared or afraid because it's new. It's so different. It's like going off into space. It's like going into a whole new reality. It's like your world will shatter almost in a, in a good way and maybe sometimes a bad way. How do you prepare people for that? Yeah, it, it's it's good that you mentioned that. It can be like shattering. I think that's like world <laughs> shattering. I think that's good for people to be aware of before going into that. But yet there are some people who are looking for that. You know, there are some people who totally. are like, I'm ready for my world to be shattered. But like, uh, the, you know, that um, someone recently joined the course and they were saying like, that's that's what they want. They kind of want to break through experience. I mean, to be honest, from the course and people uh, just working one to one with people or people that are coming on retreat, quite often there are there are people who are looking for a big experience or ego death or ego dissolution or a spiritual experience. Obviously, different people use different terms, but um but yeah that that's that's common that people have a sense that okay there's something i want to dive deeper into and to come back to your question on how does someone know when they're ready um we're going to go to the clichés but i would i would say the intuition that feeling kind of checking in with yourself about how you feel i mean what i what i enjoy about my work now is that I don't I'm kind of there for people when they've already kind of made that decision I want to go further or I'm I'm go I'm I'm going this path and then I'm like okay I now I can support you and help you on this you know I, I mean I've had my times after my early experiences you know when I, I was more maybe everyone needs to do this like almost like encouraging people like you should do you should try us <laughs> this is incredible <laughs> yeah. i've kind of over time kind of um rebalanced that or maybe rebalanced uh, not the right word but I, i'm not so forced seems right like yeah you've it. evolved evolved past that it's like an evolution past that's that. that's a nice way of putting it yeah um, yeah, yeah. maybe i've evolved let's go with that I, I like <laughs> <laughs> but yeah now i'm at the stage where I, I'm not trying to convince anyone. I mean, fortunately enough, there's enough research and media out there that's kind of do, doing that, hyping it up enough. Um, so, I mean, even sometimes a, a big part of what I do is managing expectations, uh, really, you know, because 
that's something we cover in the fourth module, walking the path, because, you know, people coming to psychedelics, there can be a high expectations, you know, and if those aren't met, which can be the case, that can sink back into feelings of disappointment and maybe then also that can come up with some other stuff like oh why did why did i pin so many hopes on this or why didn't this go how i wanted it to did i not prepare properly you know people can get caught up in that kind of thing so that's kind of coming back to the classic psychedelic tenets you know acceptance trusting the process you know these kind of core principles um so yeah but just to come back to it um yeah I, i'm at the stage now which is really nice where it's like working with people that are already on the path and they want to go further and they're looking for ways to improve their approach to learn maybe new ways new tips tricks you know ways of preparing approaching individualizing their approach you know all these kind of things and, and, and maybe connecting with other people um, and learning from other people which is something i also really enjoy about the, the founding group we had of, of the course what I really enjoyed about putting that, putting out the course that was for experienced people was that I knew I was going to learn also from the group, you know, there's, we, we had a really great range of experience in the group and it was uh, also great for me to, you know, to engage and, and get ideas sparked from, from other explorers, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And it just seems like, again, from your blog, I'm going to link a lot of resources, by the way, in the show notes of this, because I'm going to refer to a lot of things that you've written before, some of the things um, that you've kind of shared in this conversation. But yeah, I want to get into that sort of knowledge sharing and why this is amazing that it's like a group uh, course, technically, right? You're kind of going through it with people, you have a community to lead on. But at the end of the day, this is going to be an individualized uh, experience for you, which is what I think is really interesting, because especially when you're working with psychedelics, it's, it's um, you're working with each individual human's minds, right? And everyone's very different. They're going to react to things different. So obviously, it has to be very specific to them. But when it comes to like this larger group of like knowledge sharing, I think the having the group of the community is amazing to uh, have ideas from each other. But I've also noticed in one of your blog posts, you talked about... Um, during your days as uh, at the retreat that you started, you were talking about how you don't see other retreats as competitors. You don't see other people doing courses as competitors. It's like, no, these are all people in our community. We can learn from them. We can share the knowledge. And that's not something you get in other types of communities. That's not something you get in other types of industries. Everyone wants to hoard knowledge, but it really seems in this space, people are sharing their knowledge. Is that kind of like your experience with it? Like how have you been experiencing um, the knowledge sharing and how have you been able to get all of this knowledge? Because you have years and years of knowledge under your belt now. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I've learned a lot from other people sharing their knowledge, you know, uh, and, and generously sharing. And I, I'm just trying to pass that on. Um, and I've felt really, I don't know, moved really when other people who might be considered competitors reaching out to me and and giving me encouragement or or you know sharing things and i've really enjoyed that um about being in the community and having back and forth and having other people in the space kind of share things with me and and have a kind of beneficial relationship and i think we all bring each other up when we work and collaborate in this way there's some kind of discussion or debate conflict in the sphere now you know there's there's companies trying to come out with patents for certain types of approach of working with psychedelics or even combinations of psychedelics so there are some people saying kind of yeah there's there's a bit of cynicism and i think understandably so about um yeah people may be trying to yeah control certain aspects of this emerging thing and, and for profit um so yeah that that's not something i i've particularly put a lot of energy and focus on you know um i'm focusing on what i'm doing and that's and that's helping people um who are working with psychedelics yeah and hopefully it just gets easier for them to access 
the substances themselves because like there's a whole like what it seems like we can get into some of the modules especially with the session preparation like there's so many logistics that go into it to making sure that you're curating an experience um but just i want to stick on this knowledge part real quick uh because i have i have a legitimate question for you that i'm <laughs> i it's a burning question for me so you're following research studies right you're following maybe competitors you're following other explorers in the space you go to a lot of conferences you speak to people all the time how do you save all of this research do you have like a note-taking method do you have like what is now being called a second brain to like start you know uh, adding all of your research and like tagging things so you kind of know where things are going and how you can like bring that knowledge into your course and teach people do you have like a note-taking system or somewhere that you kind of like build a graph of knowledge of all this stuff yeah that's a great question um yeah building a second brain the tiago's book just came out in it i haven't read it yeah yet. Um, and it's so fresh in my mind because i'm reading that <laughs> Right. Okay. Yeah. It's on my list. Um, no, I haven't read it yet. I, well, I'm a bit influenced, um, from David Allen's getting things done. Um, I've always been a prolific note taker. Um, I always carry around a small pocket notebook with me everywhere I go. I've done that since I was a, a late teen. I think I, I, I heard about, I think it was like writers or, or comedians that that was a practice they did just to capture ideas um and that's something that i kind of just picked up and it stuck with me um so that's first first point of reference i'm a big analog guy as well i, I like pen and paper what i do now is i'll go through a weekly review as part of my weekly review process i will then go through my pads and then organize those things into where they need to go so i will have i use actually a software called scrivener Never heard of that one. I'm going right, to look that. Okay. I'm going to look that up. That's what I used to to do the course, basically the the core content and the outlines from it. That's pretty much it. Yeah, uh, Scrivener, Scrivener, right? Scrivener. Yeah, that's the, where you save all of your digital notes. That's where. Yeah, I mean, that's more specifically for projects. Um, like, uh, like, yeah, I'm currently working on a workshop, um, but. And then I'm using it for that also, and that's for the course. Um, but I mean, really, just in pads, basically. <laughs> Do you review those pads? Do you like bring them out ever and like go yes. and like maybe trip reports or journals and stuff like that? Do you bring them back? Yes. I, I go through them all. And then, kind of, once I've been through and satisfied that there's nothing that is has not been archived in a relevant Scrivener doc or put in place in a digital file, then that can kind of be laid to rest, basically, if that makes sense. And you know, you can always come back to it later, but it's like, it's safe there if you ever need to come back to it, but you don't need to have it top of mind. Yeah, I think any kind of archiving solution, otherwise it's just like kind of all over the place. But that's why I was like really, really interested. Um, recently, a lot of people moving to things like uh, Rome Research or Obsidian, these like networking, tools for thoughts, right? These like these software where you can start making these connections between things. And I think that's super interesting in the psychedelic space. And I was wondering if you did anything like that or if you know of anybody in the industry doing that kind of stuff, because I think it's a great way to do research and make new connections because we're so fresh and so new in this industry. Yeah, that's, uh, it's funny, I was speaking with a friend here yesterday and he was telling me he's been using obsidian since the start of the year and he said exactly like you that it's great for making connections between different things um i'm kind of embarrassed to say i i don't i don't really have something like that i'm pretty old school um it's something yeah i'd like to experiment with more um but uh, my kind of approach is read widely read around or it, take in a lot widely around and a lot and then connections will get made normally if I'm out running or or um or tripping but normally the, those are two times when it's then things will be like oh I didn't actually yeah like connect those things before like oh this you know you have those moments and you're like oh yeah of course like oh that's great um so yeah and then they all go in the notepads because I guess right. just like your Scrivener or like any kind of archiving solution, for me, I do it in Notion, uh, I might start using something like uh, Obsidian. But just like that, with you're talking about with tripping, it's like 
with a digital document, you have you download the idea and maybe you write notes and you archive it and it's there. Like you can make those connections. I feel like we don't give our brains enough credit. I feel like it is in there. It does get stored. Like we have like terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of storage in the brain. We're just really bad at recalling it. But maybe it's during these times when we're tripping, it those connections get made. Like it gets stored in there. It's stored somewhere deep in the brain. I feel like everything we take in gets stored some way in some kind of archiving. Uh, solution in the brain and then when you take these substances and you're tripping then those connections get made things that are in the back of your mind come to the forefront have you experienced that do you have any ideas behind that one it's kind of a random thought that popped in my head now sure yeah abs absolutely i mean I, I i wouldn't say that necessarily yeah i wouldn't say that means that it's, we don't need to use external or as yes. you were, a second brain external cataloging systems but can be effective. I mean, different bre mo parts of the brain communicate with each other on psychedelics that don't normally communicate with each other. So, I mean, that's it's pretty much a ex direct analogy. <laughs> There's, yeah. You know, um, I mean, that's also why sometimes people experience things like synesthesia, you know, like seeing colors or tasting numbers. These connections that aren't normally there are suddenly then made and that affects how we perceive things and influence things and what creates our reality um so yeah definitely definitely something there yeah and then i guess this is part of the session integration like the uh maybe the post experience ex post experiential uh, recollection or again capturing of that experience um, is that during that point where maybe you'd ask people to journal to write about their experience to maybe talk about it how are some of the ways that people actually integrate this knowledge because like we just talked about like you're taking knowledge from external sources sometimes like the ideas that you get from internal after taking psychedelics is almost like an external uh, external knowledge right it feels like it's coming from god it feels like it's coming from somewhere totally outside of yourself so you want to capture that knowledge as well. How do you um, suggest people do that? Do you have like a standardized way of doing it of like trip journaling or like trip reporting? Do you have a certain method for that? Yeah, I I do myself personally, which is slightly different actually, depending on if it's an inner journey or a creative session. Um, for an inner journey, the headphones I'm asked basically looking inwards, listening to music for the whole thing. What I kind of understand is a condensed or concentrated kind of meditation session, like observing thoughts, being with feelings. One that's the same across both is rest. I think it's just key. It's just key to allow yourself to rest. I mean, also consolidation of memory and things that's so important, sleep. So allowing rest and allowing some space, that is something that's the same for for both creative and inner journeys. Um, for inner journeys, what I will do, my my typical kind of integration is the day after, leave the day free after, allow myself to rest. Then I'll put back on the playlist that I've listened to the day before. So this is a kind of, um, it's like recreating the context of the experience, which can help bring certain things back. Also, if you've had something burning or a certain smell, any kind of triggers that you can do to bring yourself back to that experience without taking anything again, you know, basically revisiting and re remembering can help. Um, so I will even do things like, I'll, uh, depending how, um, how good I'm being, but like recreate the altar, have even leave my like eye mask over my head with the headphones on. So I'm kind of really trying to feel like I'm, I'm back there. Um, and then listen through the music and then um, journal and write an open-ended report of the experience. Um, so rather than having my attention inwards, I'm then kind of putting it out. Um, and that's, that's something I actually picked up from the research papers from the research, John Hopkins, that, that's they have people write up. They even actually do it or did the day of the trip when they go home they go in for a an, an integration meeting the day after to talk uh, with their therapist but and they're supposed to have written up an outline ready already um i don't do that actually i write it up the next day i allow myself to chill out in, in the evening and just 
and just relax. Uh, but then the next day I will take a few hours to just write, journal, everything, anything that come up, try and, uh, and then normally I'll try and pick out key themes. So there might be some, some key themes. It might be, you know, it might be something personal. It might be something health related. It might be a particular relationship. It might be some, something in myself that I want to cultivate more, you know, an attribute or something in my personality or character that if I, if I see an obstacle or something that I'm trying to overcome and I think, okay, this is more the person I need to be, then maybe that, that will be a theme. Um, so yeah, it could be anything, but I'll try and basically pick out key themes. Um, and, and yeah, and that's pretty much it. And then I'll, I'll make some, maybe if there's some key points of steps that I need to take or things that I need to do, those will then go into my task manager, basically, or, or I'll make an appointment or, okay, I need to speak to this person. This is a conversation I need to have or whatever, you know. And I'll just, that those will go into my things set up. Um, so, yeah. And then in terms of uh, creative session, that will typically be, uh, that for that, I, I will have the notepad out the whole time and I'll take basically notes throughout the whole session. During the session. During yeah. the session itself, yes. Um, and then what for those, what I'll do is a kind of session review. And then the day after, or not necessarily directly after, but within a couple of days, um, ideally, I would go through all the notes, you know, uh, because normally a, a creative session for me would be exploring divergently and not, not really converging, not going too deep on any specific thing, but just like ideas, like give me all the ideas, give me all the connections, you know write them all down, don't judge them too much, just like allow myself to be excited by them or whatever, you know, think it's the next greatest thing, whatever. Just just get them down and knowing that I'll review everything later. And then in the review, you know, that that's kind of where the integration comes in. Some of that might be like, you know, the, a bit of discernment there. Some of that might be like, okay, this is a good idea. Like, what can I do to move the, this forward or what? Yeah, like, what are the next steps to this? But there might also be things when I'm like, that sounded good <laughs> during the session. Doesn't really sound that great now, <laughs> you know? Um, or, or or maybe like, oh, this idea is great, but it's just too big. It's too ambitious. Like, there's no way I can handle that now. Or like, you know, maybe that goes in the folder for later or like, or just like, yeah, this is kind of beyond my capability now. Or, or yeah, it could be, could be anything really but that that's kind of the assessment then of the session comes in that session review so there'll be yeah what i found is during sessions more ideas come up creative sessions more ideas come up that includes more bad ideas but it also includes more good ideas and if there's a couple in there that makes everything worthwhile basically so it's kind of going through and seeing okay throw that one away throw that one away like mm, or maybe it might be renegotiating like oh this is a cool idea but it's a bit too much for me to handle now can i do a small version you know can i downscale it you know or like could be anything like that could be a creative project but often normally in those sessions other ideas will come about it might it might be like a lifestyle experiment that i want to do or it might be like a, a trip that i want to go on and for example maybe it's like oh yeah cool like go, go traveling for like three months and then but then maybe in the assessment it's like I cut that, that's not going to work with <laughs> you know, my workflow. But then it's like, okay, well, there's some part of me that wants that adventure. Maybe I can go away for a week or maybe I can work remotely for a month or something. You know, it's, So then that's kind of the integration kind of thing, like negotiating with it a little bit and thinking like, okay, like, yeah, there's maybe something to that, but not in its the original form. Um, so... Uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much that's pretty much the kind of how I, how I go about a session integration, um, and yeah, it, it's chance to rest and process. So I love that. So it's almost like in these kind of scenarios. So I would say like, what are the types of sessions? Because I want to kind of like categorize this almost. I don't want to put too many uh, rigidness to this, but it seems like 
there's different types of sessions. So you mentioned like there's the creative session where you're going to have ideas and you're going to let divergent thinking do its thing. There's also these like internal sessions where like those, I guess, more personal journey, personal, um, like therapeutic kind of sessions where you're going inwards. Obviously, like you can't really control what happens when you get shot out into space. <laughs> and sometimes you think you're going to go on a creative journey and then you take a left turn, take a right turn. And you're like, oh, shit, like this thing came up. Um, and you're, you know, something maybe deep inside of you that's like a, a personal issue comes up. Um, does that happen? Like, I mean, it must, right? And how do you deal with those kind of things? And, you know, how, how do you make sure that you're kind of like giving yourself guardrails if you are going to have an intention to do one thing and then something else happens? How do you, how, how do you help people through that? Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that yeah, should be taken into account. Um, I absolutely I'm trying to think if that's, yeah, actually that has happened to me, but I've, it's been okay. I was going to say not, but I've heard many also stories from many other people where they were going after a recreational experience. And then all of a sudden, all this stuff just started coming up. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, preparation. I think one thing that's good to bear in mind is, yeah, is basically be, just being prepared for that to happen right being prepared. so we can get into the path preparation i guess before we do that what are the types of like sessions like if you were to categorize them into the, these types of categories like what are the types of sessions the main ones then we'll get into path prep because i or session prep because i think that will inform how to get into there because the actual session itself there's nothing you can really do to control it but you can maybe prepare for one of these types of sessions so what are the main types that people could kind of expect well i've spoken a little bit about it but the inner journey it's a classic. It, most people have probably heard of some research study with incredible statistics, um, be it uh, treatment-resistant depression or end-of-life anxiety at Imperial and John Hopkins. Um, they typically use the psychedelic, what's known as the psychedelic therapy style approach. Um, and that is, for the session itself, is basically high dose preset playlist of music that goes start to finish um headphones on eye mask on direction uh, um, attention directed inwards um so yeah and that's one i use myself um that's probably been the most useful for me um in terms of yeah, in terms of my work with psychedelics. Um, and that's, yeah, that, that's great for introspection, looking inside, basically. Um, so there's that one. I use the term psychedelic therapy style session or inner journey interchangeably because, of course, if people are organizing themselves or like I do, I'm, I'm actually not working with a therapist. You some know, self therapy at that point like yeah the therapist kind is, of. is the substance it is the molecule sure yeah or as in the studies they call it psychedelic assisted yes. therapy um so they have they have psychotherapy leading up to it they go through certain things and they have follow-up sessions um so but yeah for for reference basically Oh, that's why I call it style, like psychedelic therapy, style session or in the journey. So, so there's that one basically. Um, there's creative sessions, which could look in any number of ways, really, um, because depending on on the what type of creation someone is coming up with, they can also be kind of more open ended. Um, but there might be that might be working like with art, you know, with some supplies, paper. Um, colors pens it might be working with I, i'm more of a kind of word person um so for me that's normally just a journal basically and, and pen and, and you paper. can write while you're tripping yes I feel like i would not be able to write I, like <laughs> I would have to like i would have to like vlog i would have to vlog it or i need to like do voice memos writing i would like go back and like I think I'm writing my name and then I'm drawing a picture of like the moon or something. People are like, what the hell is that? I wouldn't <laughs> be able to do that. <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, we get onto it, but that's also one thing of like um, 
you mentioned like how to, to prepare because maybe you're going to open a whole can of worms. Dosage is a big yeah. factor. Dosage is yeah. something that I think, to be honest, not talked about enough. It's such a key component. The set setting dose for me is like on the triangle. Uh, or, uh, yeah, depending which model you're using. Set maybe. setting dose, you would kind of yeah, or like set setting substance. Thing. That's another another way of looking at that. Right. Uh, there's of course the seven S's model, but there's there's also the classic set setting and substance. And within substance, of course, would be the amount of the substance um, and dose. So I think that's huge. But yeah, the, I mean, a part of it yeah, was also learning how you work. So you, it might sound like a good idea and then you realize you can't write. Maybe you have other tools. Maybe you use something, you know, that will transcribe for you. Um, I love doing that, not on psychedelics, but um, I will generally, like for my blog post, I always write the first draft pretty much dictating. I'll, I'll take my phone out and walk around and just talk to someone um, or not to someone, but imagine I'm talking to someone um, and then just go back and edit that later. But yeah, but I mentioned that because that's, a, yeah, maybe a tool that one could use. Video recording, I know people have done that also, filming themselves just talking to a camera. Um, and yeah, but people maybe also do music. That's something I do sometimes, which is great. Again, dosage is important and setup is also key. You know, I don't want to start having to, fiddle with technical cables and sound levels so that's kind of like for those sessions i have just like a big uh, it's not too big but a, a list of things that i'll run through before kind of playing as it were um so yeah there's creative sessions there's what's also i mean yeah in the kind of in the therapeutic um way of working with psychedelics the psychedelic therapy approach which we talked about there was also it was popular in the 50s and 60s psycholytic therapy um, which is contrasting to psychedelic therapy which is the high dose inner looking inwards it's working with lower doses in what would look more like a typical therapy session so speaking with someone so you know how a therapist maybe will help you to explore your world with certain questions this would be a psycholytic approach um which yeah was pretty big it's not so much in the research now um hopefully that that, that'll be more more that'll be coming back because i i think that that's good potential and um yeah i think again there's so many different ways of, of working with psychedelics so um but yeah that's basically yes speaking so that the, the personal process that would maybe come about through therapy is kind of heightened. It's on this other level, basically. And so you have someone to, to yeah, to help you go into certain topics and explore them. And I kind of myself more loosely use the term psycholytic, which I were I think of as using interaction as a means of guiding the exploration as it were so I've done what I would call kind of psycholytic style sessions with friends where maybe we will bring up a topic or something that's current in our lives or something that's something that we're kind of dealing with um, and then together we can explore it and so maybe we'll be asking each other questions, you know, and in that state, then maybe certain connections might be made that weren't made before or certain insights might come up within that kind of guided interaction. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's kind of a, the, the psycholytic approach. That then you could also kind of blend in. Sorry, this is kind of not neatly categorized. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, that could also then blend into using things like uh, they could be guided reflections. They could even be videos. So these are like subcategories, right? That can kind of go within that, like kind of more um, reflective use case of it. So it's like almost like the reflective, which kind of has a bunch of different use cases. There's like the creative. And then I guess the third like big category, would you just put under recreational? Like you just want... And open-ended, I'm just going to do it and just whatever happens. Would you just put all of that under like recreational use or how would you categorize that? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. I, I like, I think the categories are useful 
Uh, but yeah. it, in reality, sometimes they just blend with each other. Exactly. Like they they really yeah like. I, and it's also a long time, right? Within that time, like you're you can go in so many different paths, so many different ways. So I guess if people aren't like, hey, I specifically want a creative session, you just want to explore. I guess you just open ended explore and see what happens, and just like, all of these things will probably happen. Like a whole like freaking season of a television show happens in like <laughs> twelve hours somehow. You're like, how did this happen? Like, <laughs> it's crazy. It's um, it's definitely really really interesting there. Um, I guess like the biggest thing here now too is like now we're kind of getting into like you talked about. These, your, your triangle approach of like the set setting, but also like the substance slash dosage. So maybe we can like, we're, we're also working backwards here for anyone like kind of lost. We're going, we went from like uh, the session integration into the session itself. Now we're going back up to preparing for that. And I think it's useful in this conversational way to be like, okay, here's the end state and let's work our way back. Now, when they're going to be working with you and they're going through the course or they just want to like take what they've learned from here, you're going to do it the opposite way, obviously, right? You want to prepare for these things. You're going to have the session, then you're going to integrate it. But I love this conversation and this approach of like kind of working our way backwards. It kind of like gives us a different vantage point, a different like perspective of this. So if so you're cool, then maybe you know, yeah, so exactly. We can't go exactly. in a linear, normal progression. No. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So maybe we'll go back a step now. Now we'll go into that preparation. And then this preparation, I think we can leave sort of like open-ended because we'll be preparing for like these kind of sessions but then also i have lots of different questions about what people might be thinking or questions they might have while in this preparation stage and that's for me too these are questions that i actually literally have for you these are questions that people have asked me these are questions that i have a feeling an inkling that the listener right now might be thinking so let's get into the preparation of this now so we talked about these different sessions we've talked about um you know integrating these sessions and then we talked about when we'll probably loop back around after of integrating all of this into your whole life, not just the one session, but your whole life. So let's get into preparation. What are the first things that you kind of start thinking about while you're preparing for a journey such as this? Sure. Yeah. The starting point really for me is intention, which is kind of convenient because that works double on the preparation. It's kind of, I like it as the path preparation and the session preparation, you know, it's a uh, common practice or well spread kind of practice to form an intention for your psychedelic experience thinking why am i doing this what are my expectations what am i hoping to get out of it um then but i like also having an intention for your journey with psychedelics you know having an intention for why yeah, why are you walking the psychedelic path? Why why are you going down that road, you know? And so that's kind of broader and that's something that can be changed over time as well, you know? That that might not be static or fixed, but I think it's useful to to take a moment and like check in and think, okay, why am I doing this? What am I what am I going for? And to to yeah to link it this also kind of goes for the session preparation as well but having that kind of clarity at the outset i think is really useful because well one it gives a kind of it gives you some kind of direction it, it, you're not guaranteed to to know where you're exactly where you what you're going to go through but you have in your mind okay a clear reason for doing this and that is also i think very helpful for when you might encounter difficulties um, along the way, you know, and then you can return back to your intention and think like, okay, here's why, like, you know, there, then there's moments where you might think, why am I doing this? Like, what, like, why have I, why have I put myself in this situation? You know, like, this is really, <laughs> it might be during a trip or in the aftermath of a trip, you know, like, this is pretty uncomfortable. Some, some stuff that came that I didn't really want to look at. And then if you're coming back to your intention, you're thinking, okay, well, this is why I'm doing it, you know, and that can help to kind of ground yourself on that path and to have an acceptance for that and to be able to persevere also, you know, um, and to go on ahead with it. So, yeah, being intentional and working with intentions, I think that's that's a great um, starting point. Um, relationship with psychedelics mentioned before, but that is also for me kind of foundational thinking about 
yeah, what, how do we relate to psychedelics? And what are those kind of relations or what are some of those relations that you've seen? And I'm sure you have a specific relationship with them yourself, but maybe for some students, what are some ideas or what are some um, examples of these relationships? Well, yeah, if we do a bit of like looking into that, then we might find there's some kind of unhelpful <laughs> ways of relating to, and there might be all kinds of reasons for that, but then there might be kind of fear there. Um, which I would say is different. Fear of psychedelics? Yeah. Or fear, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah the, the, like kind of yeah. be beneath, you know? Yeah. Because of they're illegal. They're, I mean, now we're pretty getting, getting much better, much more acceptance, but still there are some beliefs hidden that, you know, these are dangerous things. Um, I, I think it's important just on this point to make a distinction, like for me, one of the core principles of a healthy relationship with psychedelics is respect. So not to say like, oh, don't be scared, it's all gonna be fine. But for me, there's a difference of like, oh, this is like, should I be doing this? I shouldn't be doing this, these ambivalent feelings. That doesn't lend itself to being able to trust psychedelics, which is another kind of foundational principle for me, respecting them and trusting them. Um, and these are important for a healthy relationship with psychedelics, you know, to be able to go into a session. The relationship with psychedelics for me informs the set going into a session, set mindset, internal state. So if you don't really trust psychedelics, or it could even be also maybe there's some guilt around it. I had that for a long time when I first started. I was kind of in, in the closet, as it were, or like hidden, sheltered, didn't speak with too many people about it because I was worried about judgment. Um, and lots of users have that tied up within their relationship with psychedelics. Maybe they're embarrassed, they won't share with certain people, they keep that side of themselves hidden, they might feel guilty about it. There could be all kinds of things mixed up just because of really our relationship with psychedelics as a culture, um, as it has been since, since the war on drugs and we're still recovering from that. But anyway, so yeah, kind of working on that relationship and like inquiring and, and thinking about it and, and trying to heal that relationship is fundamental to then having a good set, you know, and feeling good. And like, being able to let go about, right? Otherwise it, you're holding on too tight and you just gotta, yeah, absolutely. Wow, exactly. that, yeah, that, 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 that helped me a lot right away, right off the bat, just having that, the relationship kind of like healed because again some people may not might not even have a relationship or they think they don't have a relationship to it because maybe they haven't done it maybe they've done it once or twice but yeah that's so true you have a relationship to it whether you've done it or not in the past whether that is fear of it or you've used it as an unhealthy coping mechanism or something whatever it is but i that is so great having like the really positive relationship and a healthy relationship with it before going into it and then from there then you can really start to let go, right? Then you can start using it with a solid intention. Oh, I love that so much. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, we have a, a small exercise on the course, which is really just sitting, and anyone can try this themselves, um, but it's sitting with a psychedelic and maybe just having it in your hand, and it could be maybe be a high dose, and just seeing how that makes you feel like thinking about that, you know, and just seeing how that makes you feel and just exploring what are your feelings to that, you know, do you, do you have reverence for it? Are you like, oh shit, are you like, I hope no one sees me with it, <laughs> you know what oh, I mean? Because paranoia will set in, right? That's the set, right? Yeah, oh my exactly. God, yeah, it's so, so true. The, these kinds yeah. of things, um, so that's a simple way of, yeah, just looking into to your relationship and getting a glimpse of maybe, yeah, some of these feelings that maybe you haven't looked at and that will then maybe inform your experience. Right. And it's, yeah. of course, always best to try to amend these relationships and these feelings before having the experience. But I'm sure if you get to a point where you're like, okay, like I think, I at least I think that I have this healthy relationship, I'm sure that once you're on the trip, that will be part of that journey as well, coming to terms with it. Maybe you have that big aha realization of like, oh, this isn't so scary. Or mm -hmm. why was why is this even illegal? Why am I scared of this? Like it's it's very weird because 
Um, you know, it's a very, I mean, as far as we know, it's a non-addictive substance. Like, I mean, and we're talking about psychedelics as a whole. Like maybe at a certain point we can talk about uh, the third point on your triangle, which is like the substance and talk about a very specific one. But all in all, like we're talking like psychedelics as a whole is non-addictive, right? So you can maybe <laughs> shed some light on that. Of Maybe people have that worry as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, the safety profile of the classic psychedelics is really impressive as far as substances go. Um, in some of the safest substances on earth, not to say there aren't risks and dangers, but that's, that's why you, we yeah. need education. They're non-toxic, like the actual substance itself is sure. like not going to hurt you. May, you might do something yourself while on it, but like the substance itself is quite Exactly, safe. yeah. I mean, like with mushrooms, it's... I don't know the number, <laughs> the, the exact number, but it's an insane amount of mushrooms you'd have to uh, consume before you're getting into issues of toxicity. Again, like, part of the relationship to know that whatever you're taking, know, like, do some research on it. Obviously, you want to know what you're taking, and that way you're not thinking, oh my God, I'm going to die. I'm going to die from this. I need to go to the hospital. Like, well, if you knew ahead of time you had that relationship with it, if you're in a relationship with someone, you would know stuff about them right you're not just on a first date with this person you're like you're on like a third date here you know you're you're, you're really getting in the weeds of these people <laughs> you're going on like a, a vacation with them right you're not going to go on a vacation with someone uh, on your first date right you want to learn about them so i think like part of that relationship and like the preparation is just like knowing about the substance so do you do you do that and as part of your course of like here's like the lowdown of the the classics of what you might be taking and do you get people to like really have a great understanding of this kind of stuff to be like you need a lot of it to have any kind of toxicity like you're not going to die from this thing like do you get do you make sure people know that or is that part of the preparation not specifically actually no um uh, yeah that's that's kind of uh expect most students to know that <laughs> right you expect them to know it right but some people are like yeah i'm just gonna try mushrooms because like yeah, I did LSD before, like, I, but it's a different type of thing. I personally think for me now, preparation, I'm like, I know, and this is a question, not even for me, but for my fiance, my partner, where she's very analytical like that. Like, she will like be Googling things halfway through her trip, <laughs> right? Or something. I'm like, no, you should know right. that before. Like, you don't want to be doing that. So I think like for a lot of people, again, like, obviously more uh, experienced uh, explorers, I'll be working with you would definitely know that. But maybe for people who um, are not at that stage just yet. I think it makes total sense to have like a profile built breaking down all of these substances that you're taking so you know what it is that you're you're doing. Like you're not going to get random medication without knowing some of the side effects and you know what it should be doing to help you. So I think yeah, it's, yeah no brainer. Definitely. Well, I, yeah, in fact, that I guess that kind of falls under best some best practices um yeah that we have but yeah one of those is is knowing the substance and knowing what yeah. different dosages are um so yeah we actually don't provide that in the course currently maybe that's, that's something add to, that in to, man to bring in um substance doses what you can expect from each kind of dose yeah have like a little a little cheat sheet yeah yeah that's super helpful and i mean yeah like you say key to letting go because if you have yeah if suddenly it's really difficult then or you might feel like you're ill or there's worries or thoughts like, oh, did I take too much? Like, am I in danger now? Then you can just, the, the, the part of you that's done the homework can just, you can just quell that thing. Man, maybe not that easily, but you, <laughs> you've got that To a knowledge. certain degree. Yeah, you can say yeah. like, no, this is not possible, you know, for me to be, I'm not in any danger. I'm not. You know, this is, it's not possible for me to come to physical harm from this dose. So it's just, I've just got to relax. I've just got to kind of let go into this. Um, and that's something, yeah, we also do with people coming on the retreat. We, we, we have that as a kind of part of the preparation sheet before. Know that you are safe. Know at the doses that you will be taking, it is impossible to overdose. Like that's just not going, it's just not going to happen. Um, so yeah, and that can help bring a sense of ease and relaxation to it, yeah. Yeah, and it, it seems like that's the biggest thing uh, is having the ease and relaxation. And I've read a few of your posts where you talked about how meditation has helped you in this, um, or you spoke about, uh, well, so you, you wrote about things like um, breathing exercises that to help you calm down. 
you wrote about a specific scenario where you saw a monster on your ceiling. But as you started breathing and you started meditating, the same, I guess, visuals that you saw on the ceiling turned into magical things, something that was like a, a lot easier to deal with, something that was maybe even um, fun to experience. Like that demon turned into an angel sort of thing because of your your way, uh, your I guess your ability to calm yourself down through meditation. So um, maybe we can sort of get into that again. We're bouncing all over the place, but it kind of makes sense here. We're like, we're kind of in that space of like, if you're in a weird spot during your trip how you can kind of calm yourself down and it seems like meditation is like the perfect pairing here and um we'll get into meditation even deeper in a little bit but i think they can really help you on this journey if you're having a difficult time do you have any thoughts or do you have like specific uh techniques for people um to integrate meditation to help them calm down and, and ease and relax into the experience sure yeah absolutely I, i'm yeah i'm glad you brought it up because I think meditation or some awareness practice is like one of the most useful things to have, especially especially for solo explorers, um, because having that kind of extra awareness allows you to to navigate really to direct course to be able to see where you are and maybe. Uh, move in a certain direction or to put your attention in a certain place or to yeah to kind of to direct the experience and that might be as you mentioned through doing relaxation techniques um yeah there's a there's a, f a few but yeah i think conscious relaxation is just a great thing for any psychedelic explorer to learn one of the simplest ways is controlling the breath um, and long, deep breaths, basically. Bringing the attention to the breath and just slowing that breathing right down. Just breathing in, breathing out, and just filling the belly and then letting it go, you know, and holding, uh, and holding that tension. That's where kind of it, some kind of ongoing uh, like awareness practice helps because then you're able to hold that attention better if you are a bit more scattered then maybe like okay i'll breathe but then after three breaths your mind's jumped back onto the anxiety or the or whatever it is you know um so having some kind of practice or some kind of back background in a meditation or mindfulness practice is super helpful um and another one i think is really good is um it's kind of like shavasana going through every body part and just relaxing each part individually so you know relaxing the muscles in your face relaxing the muscles in your neck relaxing your shoulders relaxing your stomach you know and just going through sometimes what i'll do is i'll do a breath on each so breathing in, relaxing my face, breathing out, relaxing my face, breathing in, relaxing my neck, breathing out, relaxing my neck. And you can just go through systematically like that. Um, I think that's that's great. And um, yeah, and, and basically surrendering. I don't, I'm sure you know Yoga with Adrian. I've done a bunch of her videos, but she has this um, a uh, phrase that I really like, which is a flash of surrender. And how she describes it is just see how quickly you can surrender. Like when you go, when you lie down, how quickly can you let go of everything um, and just release all tension? And that's a practice, you know, it's maybe not easy to, to do, but I think that's also really useful. Um, so, yeah, I think basically controlling breathing as a, as a method of relaxation, observing the breath and slowing it down. There's a physiological response there and also that helps us to slow down and to relax. Um, so that's, yeah, that, that's a really good one, the, 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 the slowing down the breathing. And then, yeah, of course, relaxing all the individual muscles. I think that's, that's a great one. And uh, yeah, letting go, just surrendering, just like, you know. And, and you as a facilitator, um, kind of just touching on it because you've done retreats and you've been working with people one-on-one -on -one, 
but now you're getting people to kind of do it solo and that's kind of or like you're with friends or you have a sitter or whatever um you're there to tell them hey you're not breathing properly you need to slow down your breathing but when you're on your own it's kind of hard for people to recognize like oh my god i'm actually you think you're dying no it's because you're breathing right here in your chest you're breathing up into your throat and you're not breathing properly so maybe part of that preparation is like doing a week two weeks a month even of just like meditation practice of like conscious breathing so it becomes like a, an instinct in your brain to be like oh no this is not normal i'm not breathing properly so it's like you don't even think about it you just relax right into it you could even do like maybe float tanks if you've done um i'm sure you have um you know some uh, sensory deprivation tanks a float tank it's like meditation on steroids right like you're once you get it, maybe your first time you don't really do it, but once you do relax into it and you just feel that weightlessness and you're just floating there, like if you can do that, then you can do psychedelics and you know that you can kind of like relax into it. It's a very similar um, type of experience, at least from my personal experience. Um, what do you think about that? Like about as part of the preparation to kind of like get into these practices to like have these new habits? Definitely. I think that's that's great. Yeah, would totally recommend the best preparation, really. Uh, well, maybe not the best, but would would be a part of the best preparation, I would say. Um, and like you say, doing a month, maybe every day relaxing. One thing that I kind of recommend to people, uh, which is also kind of crosses over as a hack, because it's you do it when you're going to sleep, but sleep meditation. I don't know how the listeners, if they've ever tried it, but sleep meditation is kind of like the relaxing body thing. It's like a body scan meditation, but you also kind of actively letting go of any tension. Um, so you can do this when, when you're going to bed, when you're going to sleep. So just the last thing you do, I, I say it's kind of hack because you can you don't have to find extra time in the day to do it. You, you know, if you're busy, you can just, okay, I'll just do my guided sleep meditation every night before bed. Um, and that's something I did um, some time, so many years ago now, but when I was really kind of developing my meditation practice um, and I found a guided sleep meditation. It was like, I don't know, 15 minutes long, 12, 15 minutes long. Um, and the last thing I would do each night is just put my headphones in and then do that. And that kind of goes through as i talked about it, it talks you through all the body parts and says relax and obviously if you fall asleep whilst um whilst doing it that's fine um but i did i did that every night for i don't know a series of months i think and just just doing it and like you say that then it's kind of how to say what would the mind equivalent of muscle memory be <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it's mind, mind muscle memory yeah mind memory mind yeah. memory <laughs> just, i guess that's just memory yeah just <laughs> 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 that's yeah. hilarious uh, but yeah then that becomes kind of natural it's like instinctive you're like you just kind of get into that way of just checking in with yourself and relaxing all the things and that's like perfect for being on a trip and rather than sleep though you'll just go off onto onto some stream or you know into some experience but yeah absolutely and so where can people find that guided meditation is it something you found online is it like a free resource that we can maybe link to yeah yeah absolutely uh, i'll send you over a link um and cool. we can include it in the show notes yeah there's one awesome. i've used i mean i guess people find one one they like um there's insight timer is a good app for people to find um guided meditations i was going to bring it up because you're uh you've done some guided meditations on insight timer and do you still do them like regularly that's true i haven't actually uploaded one in a while I maybe you should do a sleep one <laughs> maybe you can create your own uh sleep guided sleep meditation yes i do have a conscious relaxation when it's inside the course <laughs> that's, cool. that's <laughs> but, awesome yeah um there's you should totally put that on Insight Timer, and then maybe like in the description, you can link out to the course. I don't know if they allow that in the app, mm. or it might be a great way as a free resource put on Insight because Insight Timer has become my um, meditation app now. I used to use like Headspace and Calm. Insight Timer has now become like my main meditation app because oh, sometimes cool. I don't even want a, a guided one. I'll just put the timer on. And but I think more and more people are using it, and they're finding out um, new techniques. So I would highly recommend putting it up there, man. Use it and then sure. use it as sort of a link building uh, marketing technique or tactic to bring it into your course. People are like, oh, I like this guy. Oh, and here's even more. You can explore even more. Cool. 
Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, may, maybe I'll get it uploaded. Uh, like you recorded already, yeah. right? It's no extra yeah. work. <laughs> yeah, it's there. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's awesome. The other thing I want to bring up, because we talked about sort of like the, the meditation to kind of ease you down. I've seen some of your writings. You talked about u- utilizing other substances like nitrous oxide to help with um, with easing yourself. Do you still recommend that? It, uh, do you recommend mixing psychedelics? Is that safe to do? Do you recommend or just... I want to know your thoughts on that now because it could have been an older post, but I know it's something you've done in the past. Sure. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't use it so much now, to be honest. Um, I don't, generally don't recommend it unless someone is, I mean, to be honest, normally people I work with, um, they're looking for insight, introspection, reflection, growth. Um, right. Nitrous oxide, I'd recommend like for exploration. Uh, If you want to explore some other reality or you want to go to some, yeah, you want to experience something totally different, um, Mm. then combined with other psychedelics, that is up there. (laughs) <laughs> yeah because it's i think you your psychedelic history started uh, from what I'm, i read in my research um you you mixed lsd mdma marijuana and nitrous oxide for your first like big experience what was that like like again do you recommend doing that or is like do you recommend just sticking with one and doing the one um obviously it was your first time and i'm sure there's a different intention there and you have a different relationship with the the um the substances at the time yeah, that was absolutely wild. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess that was a, a, a first initiation or something like that, you could say. Um, yeah, that, that was when I would say my, uh, it was a little more recreational. Yeah. Um, how, in terms of recommending it, I, I, yeah, like I say, the people I, I work with are normally not after that experience, so I, I wouldn't right. really recommend it. Um, but it's, but yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'd say not recommend it. Um, <laughs> nitrous oxide also has a really interesting history. Um, you know, like William James, a Harvard psychologist, seen as one of the like fathers of modern psychology. He was a big nitrous oxide guy um he wrote about it he said it helped him to understand like the philosophy of hegel um he yeah he wrote some classic books like varieties of religious experience um so he's like a big uh, like a, a big and influential thinker really um and he wrote about his use with nitrous oxide um so yeah, there, there's something I, I would like to see more research done on it, to be honest, because I think it's a really powerful substance and it's, yeah. it, it can really bring about incredible experiences. I mean, yeah, th- those, for me, what I'll say about on those wild things, that really kind of just like blew my perception of reality open. The uh, unplugging of the matrix, full red pill. Like, <laughs> yeah. That right. was it. That was the moment for you. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Is that what started all this? Like for your love and passion for psychedelics? Or was it? I know you had a other really big trip report. I think it's like in part two of your psychedelic journey, where you talked about um, a solo experience at a friend's house that really, I think, maybe uh, changed your relationship to psychedelics and maybe on the path that you are now, uh, rather than a recreational, but using it as a tool to like enhance one's life. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the 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 first experience um, was really, I guess, a questioning of reality, or mm. or how to say better. Uh, reality is not all that you thought it was. Basically, like his his <laughs> his had an experience which was like wow okay there's way more it's not one of those things you then realize what little you know kind of thing um or you probably don't but you have you get closer to realizing how little you know um 
And that was really, yeah, for me, that just sparked a curiosity and a fascination in awareness, reality, perception, how, like, what, you know, re like reality is kind of how we perceive things and our perspective on things and sensations. And, you know, so though that first experience was, was more like wonder and awe. Mm. Um, and the, the other experience that came many years, that, that kind of sparked my curiosity in psychedelics as well. And I never kind of went too far away from them. Um, but the second experience which you talked about, which was, yeah, a, a solo experience. Um, I love how we can hear the, uh, the German sirens in the background. Yeah. The here. Let's just enjoy it for a second, especially for our North American listeners. It's so different than the sirens we you have in have... Canada or US. It's just it doesn't different sound like that. No, no, it doesn't America. sound like that. It's, it's very uh, European. Yeah, we don't, we don't have that here. So, and I guess yeah. for anyone wondering, he has the, John has the window open get some yeah. natural natural yeah. beauty in here but it's great yeah um yeah the second ex or i guess maybe not second experience but that other experience um the sure. solo trip at your friend's place i probably yeah maybe second landmark experience yeah you'd say um but that really opened my i mean sure there was awe and wonder but that also that really opened my mind to the healing potential of psychedelics more um that's not something I had really experienced to that point. Um, and I was going through some things in my personal life at the time and my, my parents were separating and we were leaving the family home. And so there was a lot of, a lot of things going on inside me around that time. And that experience really helped facilitate the personal process, which helped me to heal from everything that was going on and that gave me yeah a, a, a real appreciation of the healing and therapeutic potential of psychedelics as well as then also the total also impressed like mystical dimensions as well uh, but that was something i'd kind of experienced before so that, that wasn't right. as new, but it was a, it was kind of again like wow, and then oh, well, you can also like you, you can also use these things on a maybe useful on a less cosmic level, but also like very personal process. Yeah, that's that's incredible. And I guess the other question I have around this is sort of like, um, how safe is it to do them often, or how, what is the effectiveness? of them doing it often and then maybe like on a reverse of that maybe not how often but just like how how often would you recommend doing this like um is it like a once a month once a year like is it just uh, what like how often would you recommend not that everyone should or whatever like what would you think would be the ideal after having all these experiences yourself and guiding people through these experiences well, i'm gonna give a total cop out answer <laughs> but it's it's genuine um which is i would say it really depends um i again i mentioned like kind of being i'm also kind of agnostic about frequency of use mm. um and that's kind of schedules and frequencies also something we cover in the course but basically but you know some people have one psychedelic experience and they say that's enough for them for life you know um then you have other people working on much more frequent schedules and i mean if people go to the amazon typical to work with ayahuasca it's pretty common I th i'd probably say it's more common than the other way that people would work consecutive nights you know people will be there mm. for a week and drink ayahuasca maybe five times or like five nights in a row or be there for two weeks and be drinking every other night you know so that that's also like quite a lot and then you've got now our like in the research model it's normally like between one and three sessions within a longer period of psychotherapy and the kind of sessions the, the therapy is revolved around the session so there's lots of different ways of working with them um and i think that again also it, it kind of comes back to a little bit of personal discernment um thinking but yeah like maybe not rushing back in taking some time to integrate previous experiences um 
and and yeah be- before going back in and and then returning once once ready um however yeah there's also you know sometimes it can be the fact that you know even in integration we can hit blocks you know like for example maybe maybe we get stuck in in somewhere or hit a kind of block and then a psychedelic session will be helpful or move some energy or help something move through and then maybe we go back to integration but it's possible we also might hit a block with integration in which case then you might actually be ripe to go back into the psychedelic space even if you haven't fully integrated i mean i've heard people say oh you should make sure you've squeezed every drop of juice out of the last experience before going into the next one um for myself Mm -hmm. Personally speaking, um, I found that to not be practical. Um, and sometimes just a refresher or something, you know, or m- maybe mm-hmm. you've heard the term, once you hear the message, hang up the phone. Um, oh. That's an Alan Watts quote that's been around yeah. a lot in the psychedelic space and I, that it's been taken to mean like, yeah, if you've, if you've kind of got the message, you don't need to keep taking psychedelics, like you need to work huh. on integration. Um, but I would say like, it can be useful to get a reminder of the message sometimes, you know, or maybe there are different messages to receive. So I I don't think it's quite as straightforward as, as that interpretation, um, says, but yeah, I think there is a lot to be said for, um, integration of experiences and, and putting in some work. And sometimes it can be kind of mundane and, you know, it can just be, yeah just kind of like um yeah boring even or just like hard work you know to to implement some of those changes um but yeah sometimes they can be helpful and yeah people can work on different schedules Um, and that that also again like other things may not be static you know maybe Mm -hmm. someone's going through a period and they'll work more frequently and then they'll have a long break maybe they won't trip again for a year or maybe someone might find they do it once a month to check in. Um, so, yeah, I would say really it depends on the person and where they are in their journey. Um, but I, I yeah, but I've also what what I've found from working with people and myself is that generally a, a condensed period, maybe like a retreat where there's like three sessions. Or just doing like even like two ses- two days in a row, um, that can help to kind of go deep. But you know, like peeling layers of an onion back, and then you kind of get off the surface level, and then you're kind of digging in a little bit deeper. Yeah, well, that's a kind of a non-answer, <laughs> but, but it uh, does. I mean, it, yeah. it totally. It again, it just helps um, understand the relationship even further with these uh, experiences and these substances, where it's like it's it's not static, as you said, it's very fluid. And like, you really understand that when you are on it, but it's getting, again, the helpful reminder um, of these kind of experiences and these lessons. And, you know, you talked about before with meditation, like you can reach these levels of consciousness um, through meditation, um, through jogging, through like um, music, getting lost in music, and you have like a reminder. So it's like having that big experience. And as you said, some people can just do it once and they just need it just to like kind of understand and then they can do other experiences to remind them about it but they might not need to do it ever again it's like the one time one and done and again this neatly wraps kind of our conversation here in a bow in a little while in a little bit i guess because it's talking about being more intentional right uh with psychedelics and improving our relationship with it and i think that's what you're really doing here with the course with your teachings with your blog with what we're doing here on this conversation there are still so many things I want to talk to you about. We could be on here for hours, but we're at about an hour and a half point here. So maybe we'll do a part two. I've also been talking on this podcast about doing um, almost like a virtual um, uh, round table with other people um, to talk about these different ideas. Maybe we get, maybe we go, go more deep on retreats and the group for solo experiences. I didn't even really have a chance to ask you about that now that we're coming up on so much time. And I feel like we could have these conversations for hours and hours and, and talk about these things. But I think we're at the point here where it's like the the message here really is how to be more intentional uh, with psychedelics and to have a better 
relationship with them. So on that front, kind of getting to our last section of questions and, and such like that to wrap it up, what would be your biggest advice for people to become more intentional uh, with psychedelics and to improve their relationship with it? Yeah, I think, and yeah, we could totally go on all day. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, yeah, I think in terms of being intentional, really taking taking time. I mean, it's also kind. Of, it's like having a good relationship with any. If you have a good relationship with a person, you need to make time for them, um, and that would also apply in terms of being intentional like make time to learn about psychedelics like we talked about a bit you know make time to think about or, or take time to think about why you're engaging with psychedelics make time to think about what you're looking for from a specific experience um and your yeah, journaling um meditation those are those are all great practices you know, these kind of inquiry, uh, forms of inquiry, where we're just taking some time to think and reflect and contemplate and, and yeah, lo looking inwards to ourselves, like, what do we want? What, what are we hoping for? You know, what are we hoping to learn? What are we, how are we hoping to, to grow? Um, and, yeah, just just take, taking some time to to think about those things and to to learn about psychedelics, and I think that's also a great way to improve the relationship with psychedelics. Another thing I mentioned, just not to go into too much, but in terms of also uh, improving that relationship, I think is is connecting with other people uh, who are also using psychedelics. Um, as we kind of spoke a little bit about there might be some yeah i mean if you're the only person you know doing it then yeah you might feel a bit like an outsider that's maybe not integrated into your life as much and that's going to have an effect on on how you relate to psychedelics and when you start speaking with other people and like all kinds of people using them um for like just genuine good reasons you know there's people just trying to help themselves and improve themselves and when you speak with these people and, and get to know other people it's like oh you, you know that that can really bring a sense of depending how your relationship was before but i mean for me initially when i started it was also some kind of we've got the sirens again <laughs> uh yeah um and then being able to share that with people that like and connect with people that kind of bring a sense of relief a little bit um and also a sense of connection you know like anything you know if, if you if you um if you love a band there's a band you love and you don't know anyone else that loves them you can still love them but it can also help you know it's also really nice when you connect with someone and you're like yes that album's incredible like yes you know uh, going to a concert alone versus with a friend versus a group of people totally yeah. it's a totally different experience right and, and it really um it allows you not to be in your own head as much too right and I, I so that's amazing man and it seems like this is exactly what you're doing like with the course now so i'll give you this chance in the space here because i really think if people want to uh, improve their relationship and kind of go further, as you're saying, and learn a little bit more and have that community. Um, I don't really know any other place right now off the top of my head that's doing what you're doing. So I'd love for you to kind of, but talk about the the course and what you're doing and the community that you're building and kind of an invitation to people who found this conversation interesting. If they want to go deeper, I'm sending them right to you. Like this is the place you are the person that at least I know of um, that I would trust wholeheartedly in this process for myself and, you know, it's who I'd recommend for anyone else. Sure. Well, thank you, Josh. I really appreciate that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really, like you say, it's a chance for people to go deeper, really, um, mm -hmm. with psychedelics and, and a chance to explore and a chance to connect and, we go deeper by being a bit more intentional, by exploring more and 
and trying different things and being exposed to different ideas and incorporating different things. I mean, one thing I feel about the course is I've tried to like just like cram loads of ideas or like things that people might try or things that might inspire people in terms of how they approach or how they might prepare or things they might do. Um, and I feel like if there's one one technique that someone incorporates into their psychedelic practice, even if there's just one thing that it will pay for itself over the long term, if so, if someone's going to continue to use them, if it's like one technique of integration or, or, or one way of preparing or something that they discovered about how they're approaching psychedelics, that's my genuine hope and belief that that if anyone can pick up something like that then it will easily be worth it um i hope lots of opportunities for that to happen um so yeah it's really for anyone looking to go deeper or maybe looking to expand or to freshen up their practice a bit maybe they've glimpsed and they they think okay yeah that's something i want to go deeper into and uh learn in a in a um a group experience you know i think that adds a lot and i think that really contributes to the learning process when we learn alongside other people so that's kind of a big part of the course itself that's awesome and john honestly i just want to thank you for you know putting your life and your effort and your passion into this because i think it's so important and i think it really is going to make a big dent in humanity and in you know, just the universe, because again, like you don't know the ripple effects, like someone that takes that one idea, they have a different type of experience, they have an idea, something comes to them, and then they make that happen in the world. Like there's only the positive things that can come from this. It's not really like it's dampen dampening anyone's life. It's really enriching their life. And through that, obviously, humanity and other people. So I just thank you, man, for like, putting your heart and soul and passion into this um for anyone that wants to check it out what's the name of the course and where can they find it online sure um thank you josh it's, it's uh touching for you to say that it's uh yeah it really means a lot and you can find it on maps of the mind.com that's my website so uh yeah it'll be there we we've been to the founding course i'm now uh integrating the feedback and making some updates to the course um so maybe by the time this airs i'll be launching again for the next cohort um which yeah I'm, I'm really looking forward to and seeing seeing who joins absolutely man that's awesome and honestly maps the mind like your whole website um has been like a go-to resource for me now so i hope you keep writing on there as i'm sure you will on the blog adding more resources it seems like that's also your knowledge graph we talked about rome research and obsidian and all those things but all your stuff gets published to your site where then other people can learn. And again, I've been like making notes from some of your blog posts and those go into my notion and that comes into my brain and I'm taking clippings from your ideas. So thank you for putting that online. And, you know, this is a great resource. So anyone, you know, if you're listening to this and you, you want to go deeper, you want to even just learn more uh, maps of the I will link all the stuff in the show notes and people can also still work with you directly one on one. Right, John? So they can go on the same website and they can connect with you. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there's, yeah, you can contact me through the website and get in touch. I work with people in the Netherlands. So we do it legally above board, above ground. Um, and yeah, yeah. People can That's reach awesome. out to me through that. Fantastic. Um, so I guess the last question I really have for you, I love to end this on a high note, um, you know, just kind of wrap this all up. We talked about so much of your journey, the psychedelic journey, but what's next? I want to know what you're excited about. What's something that you're looking forward to? What are you excited about that's coming up? Well, besides the uh, course relaunch and getting the next group through, um, I do you mean personally or? It's up to you, man. What are you excited about? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, really, I mean, I'm excited to see what happens. You know, we're at this amazing point where psychedelics, it's moving, you know, and we've, I, you know, a big part of that kind of mainstream or popularizing was Michael Pollan's book. Um, and then in the last year or so, there's maybe been a slight, we could say like contraction in the, in the movement after this huge expansion. Um, and now there's the, a Netflix series is coming out 
um, in July with Michael Pollan again. So I guess that's going to be huge, and I guess that's going to be the next wave of psychedelic expansion. It's going to be on everyone's Netflix home screens, you know. Um, so I'm really excited to see where, yeah, w what that brings uh, and where that goes. And in terms of myself personally, I'm also excited about exploring more. You know, this is what I really love about psychedelics. I just feel like there's no end to to learning with them and, and about working with them. And uh, yeah, I, I'm excited to explore that alongside other people as well, you know? Absolutely. Well, as you can see from the excitement on my face, I'm very excited about that Netflix series because I love the book. It's, it's How to Change Your Mind, right? And they're making a series about it. I remember Michael Pollan talking about it on perhaps Joe Rogan's podcast. We said the visuals that they made for that are unlike anything we have ever seen on screen um, for the psychedelic experience. I think people who have experienced psychedelics, he said that they will, um, as we talked about the reminder, you'll have that psychedelic experience because it's not like, you know, the weird kaleidoscopic effects from the 70s that we saw. He says it's something new, something fresh. They worked with a VFX team to make something really amazing and very true to the experience. So I'm so excited about that. I didn't know that was coming out in July. That's like, uh, it might be out by the time this podcast is out, actually. So uh, I'll link that in the resource as well. I'm super excited. Man. That's that's cool. I, I hadn't heard that, actually. Yeah. yeah. I guess if they've got Netflix money behind it, then it's <laughs> going to be next level visuals. Um, that is something to be excited about, man. Yeah. And then, of course, as you say, the infinite game, the infinite game of psychedelics is always something to be excited about. Again, we didn't get to that, man. This is in my notes about um, your philosophies on life as a game. That's a big part of my life philosophy. So we have to do uh, part two. Um, I don't want to keep us too long here because there's just so much to get into there. So part two, I'm bookmarking it here um, as reference for us to come back to that as well. That sounds of, great. Uh, life as a game, the game of life will have a part two. That sounds great. I'd love to. Yeah, I can talk all day about that. So um, yeah. Sounds good. That's amazing. Well, John, again, thank you so much just for your wisdom, your knowledge, sharing and having this amazing conversation with me today. Um, I already have a bunch of notes from here. Um, I'm going to put them in my show notes for the podcast. I'll link all of the resources that we talked about, your website, the course. Um, and then I'm going to follow up with you and show you kind of like some of my ideas that popped in my head during this conversation about how I'm building out a little journaling template in Notion so I can have like maybe my path preparation, my session preparation, and then I can journal that experience. So you gave me a lot of tangible tips that I think a lot of people listening would probably take away. And if not, I will make it very apparent for you and I'll make resources out of some of the knowledge that I took away um, and continue to share because it seems like that's just the nature of this industry, man. We're just sharing knowledge and it just feels amazing. So thank you for bringing your wisdom and knowledge onto this podcast. Amazing. That's super cool, Tay. I look forward to it. And thank you, Josh. Thanks for having me on. Real pleasure speaking with you. And uh, yeah, thanks for facilitating and setting up this conversation and getting it out there. Likewise, man. Well, thank you so much. And I can't wait to do it again. Likewise. Cheers. Take care. Bye. Cheers, guys.